single answer I have for people, which I think is the greatest answer, which is don't look for external factors to validate the love and the reality that you can have in this moment, regardless of the Illuminati, the darkness, the bad guys, what they're doing to you. It's not, it doesn't have to affect you. You can have love and joy and peace in your life because the source that you get that from it is on access all the time, every moment of every day. And that is only pure love. I'm Jonathan Otto, and this is the Lifestylist Podcast. Okay, LSP listeners, I've got a crusher of a show for you today, my friends. If you caught my prior episodes on the pandemic and related events of the past two years with folks like David Icke, Dr. Tom Cowan, Dr. Rashid Buttar, Charles Eisenstein, and Kelly Brogan, you are in for some mind-blowing information about the medical tyranny we are currently experiencing. But fear not, my friends. This one goes far beyond the fear porn and rage common in the truth or movement. My guest Jonathan Otto and I explore some powerful and creative solutions to the issues we face both on a physical and metaphysical level in this conversation. If you're new to this podcast, I'll recommend uh, buckling your seatbelt as the ride could be a bit jarring at times. If snake venom bioweapons and detox protocols to get them out of your system is new to you, I'll encourage you to stay tuned and to keep an open mind. It might just save your life. And some of the information presented here is pretty far out, yet at the same time seems to have a solid body of proof behind it. Folks, this is episode 418, Injection Recovery Protocols and Finding Forgiveness for Perpetrators of Evil with Jonathan Otto. We're going to cover a lot of information here, and uh, I'm guessing many of you are going to be taking some notes. So I want to let you know if you are interested in getting your hands on the detox protocols mentioned or any of the other details discussed, you're definitely going to want to dig into the show notes and links. You can find all of that at lukestory.com slash auto. That's O-T-T-O. lukestory.com slash auto is your home for show notes. Let's get to know our guest. Jonathan Otto is an investigative journalist, filmmaker, and humanitarian. His life narrative is characterized by his unceasing desire to uncover truth and alleviate suffering. I think we have a lot in common in regard to his life purpose. The Australian-born filmmaker attributes a childhood experience as being the catalyst for his passion. To check out Jonathan's archive of alternative health documentaries, here's what you do. Go to lukestory.com slash health secrets. Again, that's lukestory.com slash health secrets, or just click on that link in your podcast app show notes. And as a matter of fact, yours truly was featured in one of Jonathan's documentaries. So you might just find it there if you visit that link. Now, the topics covered in this one are varied and vast. So I'll just offer a couple teasers here to get you primed for the show. We discuss finding the courage to go all in on spreading the truth the surprising parallels between third world countries and developed countries, using nicotine and other surprising tools to detox quaxine venom, focusing on solutions, not just indulgence in trauma and danger, why some people still trust the government at this point in history, the underpinnings of storylines in movies that program us unknowingly, why you might experience hangovers from violent films, the real reason the bad guy always has to die at the end of a story, Ted Bundy's dying testimony and what we should learn from it. Shaping society's values by subtly breaking down values. How the powers that be work to shape society's future values by subtly breaking down our past values. How Hollywood is targeting children through film and TV. Mr. Otto also breaks down the Hegelian dialectic and its role in the current culture war. And finally, the paramount importance of living according to love instead of fighting evil, and so, so much more. If you find yourself relating to the episode you're about to hear, I have a feeling you'll love my Telegram channel, where I post all of the forbidden content that would be censored on the big tech platforms. You can find it at lukestory.com slash telegram if you've got the stomach for it. Now it's time to dive into the expansive heart and mind of Mr. Jonathan Otto. Enjoy the show and big blessings to you and yours. All right, man. Jonathan Otto, here we are, brother. Yep. Great to see you again. Same. You were one of those people that I ran into this weekend and was like, I totally know that guy and had no clue uh, where or when. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, you know, and then you reminded me in one of your uh, many documentaries that you created that you featured me in the film. And I realized, wow, I never even saw that. So yeah. hopefully I made the cut. Um, but here we are, and, and you were on a panel yesterday um, here at Paleo Effects, and 
I just really liked your energy and your perspective and wanted to learn more about you and your work. And I'm really excited to have this conversation with you. Thank you, Luke. And thank you for seeing me. And thank you for being that kind of person. I think that that's, that's a beautiful thing, just to be seen, the fact that you noticed that. And was, I find that very, um, uh, very inviting and um, cathartic. It's just, you know, just to be noticed. I think. Yeah. 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 Well, there's kind of a, and you might have this with your filmmaking, but for me, there's, um, there's a secret sauce, gut instinct, yeah, that guides my selection of podcast guests, and sometimes it's calculated and thought out, and there's um, perhaps a bigger purpose or agenda, strategically or relationally or other ways. And other times, I just meet someone. I'm like, I like their energy. It's going to be good. Yeah, you know. And my instincts, uh, thankfully, are, are pretty good in that regard. Well, I think they are. So. Um, so I almost don't know where to start because normally I'm very prepared for conversations and this one is going to be very spontaneous and spur of the moment, which is exciting. Cool. Um, perhaps we could begin by exploring some of your background in filmmaking and then maybe kind of just dip into some of those um, topics that you've covered in your films and expand on those. Sure. Because I think you have these like kind of neat buckets of these topics that you've covered in your films. Um, many of them quite controversial. So I want to let the people know that are listening to this podcast, although podcasts at this point in history aren't terribly um, censored, the other mainstream media um, you know, or legacy media channels are. And so we're probably going to have to use some coded language to try yeah. to get this message out. So if people are listening, you're like, what are they even talking about? Uh, know that we're trying to be mindful about um, not just getting totally nuked from the internet. Yeah. Especially exactly. with the the new Ministry of Truth that uh, that this regime has uh, recently installed, mm -hmm. uh, which would have been a couple months ago by the time this comes out, where they've, you know, now the White House has put someone in place to decide what information is misinformation or true information, which is terrifying to democracy. True. Um, but we'll do our best to speak freely and yet at the same time, you know, try not to shoot ourselves in the foot, so to speak. You got it. So maybe um, let's start with how you kind of got into filmmaking and what led you into covering some of the more controversial topics that you've covered in your films. Yeah, sure. Thanks for asking. So for me, it was this interest in, in people. And I had made a connection when I was really young, like I believe it was at age seven, that people were suffering immensely. And I had the audacity to believe that there was something that I could do about it. And media was just an avenue for that. So at first, it was this World Vision commercial where children were clearly hungry. It was, and it certainly tugs on my emotions, but I, I was breaking down emotionally. And my mom saw me and she's like, what's wrong? She says like, we need, and I say to her, we need to sponsor a child. And she says, well, you, know, you can do that if you learn how to make money. So I started delivering newspapers in order to like learn how to generate revenue using that to sponsor a child. But as I, um, then I, I decided, I thought, wow, there, there's so, so many problems in the world. What if I could be a part of the solution and use media to tell a story, to put an end to some part of that or as much suffering that I could? And so I, I developed uh, skills in uh, storytelling as I went through. Like um, early in high school, I started covering subjects uh, like injustice and um, developing world issues and researching these things and presenting on them. And by the age of 17, I was traveling out to uh, Tanzania with World Vision and doing humanitarian aid work and advocacy. And that's when I first started pulling out the video camera and capturing stories and and I, and I felt like if I could tell these stories that it would somehow make all the suffering of what had happened to people make sense and that it would, um, that story would be able to uh, be, bring light to their situation that would mean that it wasn't just for nothing. And so that was motivating that. I did a degree in journalism and media production and in Australia. I, I went on to do a diploma of education so I could teach and teach English literature, but I really then found myself gravitating back to telling story through film and investigating and doing deep investigative journalism into things that I felt that were creating suffering worldwide. And so then that was a huge discovery for me to see that people were suffering and whether it was autoimmune disease or cancer or dementia due to a lack of information and lies that were being perpetuated and that truth told through uh, stories and through 
expert advice and conversations, protocols, information, this could save lives and create uh, the future that I believed that was going to be best and what I would want for myself and my family. So then I became very dedicated to that. And that then naturally ended up taking me down some controversial paths. And in the last year, it got even more controversial, which, which I dreaded. I have a young family. I, it was a very sobering conversation with my wife saying, I, I, want, I, I, I feel like I need to cover these subjects. She said, well, you need to pray to God and ask him if that's what you want. I said, I, I think that God is the one asking me to do this. So it was just a really interesting experience. Yeah, it's uh, it is interesting when you're in a position um, like you and I both are in, in our different respects of producing media, and you have a drive to share information that that you believe in your heart could help people, and sometimes that information is inherently controversial and could bring about repercussions unto your livelihood. Um, I, I, you know, I am, I have a growing family, I have a wife and a couple pets as of yet, but we're, we're working on expanding that. Amazing. Um, but it's one thing if, if you're just kind of a solo renegade, right. That's just like, I don't care. I'm going to speak my truth and they can cancel me if they want. Right. Yeah. But it's interesting now in the socio-political and industrial medical complex system that, you know, one's livelihood, their family's reputation, and even in some extreme cases, their very life itself yeah. can be threatened from going too far, right? Yeah. You're, you're really, you know, kind of t- tempting fate in some cases if you go too far out there. So I, you know, I respect the fact that you've been able to do that. And it's wonderful that you have a partner that's able to stand behind you, even though it is in some ways dangerous, as extreme as that might sound. Mm-hmm. Um, when we're talking about the V A C C I N E S, for example, the yep. C O V I D, you know, these kind of things. Yeah. The audience will see where I'm going with this coded language and we'll come up with abbreviations as we carry on. But, you know, and some of the stuff you've covered in your films, I mean, it's not just like, oh, I'm going to get written off as a conspiracy theorist kook and that could hurt my career. It's like literally you could be demonetized. PayPal can cut you off, Chase can cut you off. YouTube cut you off. All the social media platforms, you get what I call Alex Jones, you know, Mm. who I think was kind of the test case for them to say, let's take someone who is viewed as very extreme by a large portion of the population. Let's unperson him completely all at once in a unified fashion Mm. and see what happens. And no one stood up for him because he has points of view that are generally controversial to so many people, Mm. despite his massive, massive audience. Um, and the fact that we now look back and go, he was right about 95% of the crazy shit that he was talking about you know, mm-hmm. over the past 25 years. But once they did that, I was like, oh, I have a kind of a, a, um, a fork in the road here. Like, do I want to play it safe and like protect my brand, protect my revenue, my family? Or do I want to find a way to creatively and strategically speak my truth and give a platform to some people like a David Icke or someone who is generally considered to be um, very cancelable, you know. Yeah. So it's really interesting to me that you've kind of made a decision to move forward um, with the hope of benefiting humanity at at the possible um, personal risk involved. Mm. Yeah, no. I, how I, did, you know how? I guess how did you? What is it in you? Is it your personal integrity or your faith in in goodness and humanity and love that just feels that um, you're in some way protected or insulated from? harm's way because the mission is feel so right to you you know what is it that kind of i think it gives you the courage to just go you know what this is what i'm I'm supposed to do i'm doing it i think it's something like that for me the visceral experience of being with people that have been injured and their lives have been like tragically thrown into this chaos and they suffer so much children and children with parents that are they, they're not sure if they're going to make it after they've had an injury from taking these things uh, into their body, these injections. And, and then, you know, kind of, you think about it when you're with them in that moment and you're feeling everything they're feeling and it just kind of passes through. You're able to be a spectator and you feel like a little glimpse of what it would be like to be in their shoes. I don't know if you have many options at that point. For me, I, I haven't felt like I've really had any options. It's like, this is what I need to do. And then on, on the other token, you see it both ways. You say, well, I don't want to put my family through this. 
And then on the other side, I don't want my family to be in a world where these things uh, are uh, let to be. And then what do I say to them? And you know, what world do they have anyway? So then that's why I play all out because it's all or nothing because it, that's hell anyway. So I may as well stand and speak truth. And I do believe in that. I do believe in protection. And, and then I also believe that like if it was my time or if I, I accept that, I, believe in a, I actually believe in eternal life. There's th- things that make me play a little less scarce than what I, wouldn't, that it, what I would have if I didn't believe in those things. So that kind of yeah, pretty that's, encouraging. That's a good point. Mm. That's a good point. I always think of this. I, it might be from ancient Greece. I, I want to trace the origins of it, but it's this principle: if you die before you die, you never die, mm. right? And oh, that, that's cool. That I mean, there's so much in that, but being able to view one's life experience as just a chapter in an in an infinite film. <laughs> you know mm. what I mean? Speaking of film, right? But we get so myopic and like, oh, this is my name. This is my persona, my identity, my family. This is the one shot I've got. Yeah. Right. And inherent to that is is so much fear of death because this is your this is your one, you know, game, right? Mm. Versus, oh, this is just a chapter, you know, not that I don't value my life and do everything I can to preserve it. But I think that worldview does enable one to access perhaps a deeper level of courage and um mm lower your aversion to risk yeah right? because you know like uh ah, this isn't the only game in town like we're exactly gonna, we're gonna play this one hard hopefully play it right to the best of our understanding and know mm. that you know in the great scheme of things we will carry on right exactly yeah it, to me it's like this twofold it makes me more sober with choices that i would have been more reckless on which is interesting so it makes me uh, less likely to do something like really physically dangerous where i'm like i could die doing this this thing i you know i have children that's not that's not a future I want to put them through. I don't want to go out on those terms, right? And then on this other hand, it's, you know, if this is right, if this is going to, to help people. Like I was in um, Kenya and we were doing some pretty dangerous missions in that, like I was in a police camp and they even just said with me having a phone out, they would, I'd get shot at just at night because they would see the light and they'd just shoot and kill and they turn that thing off, right? And so we were right near the Ethiopian border and it was, and it turned out to be true in that we had one of our drivers shot. Uh, he survived, but then I, my wife was even pregnant at the time when I went out to do one of the famine relief trips. And I just realized, wow, the stakes keep getting higher for me in the sense that should I be doing this? Is this the right thing to do? And then the two realities is people starving and suffering. And I just then trust. And because we, we're at risk anyway, if we get in a car and drive, I'm at risk if I'm there. I think it's actually surprisingly comparable. So it's, I think it's just like living in love, but also being mindful of the fact I'm in a relationship. So there's, I have to be patient with that. I have to talk to my wife, not like I'm doing this. Rather, it's like, how do you feel about this? And let her take time to feel into that and to, to love you know, that caused those people independently. And then for us to say, wow, this really matters to us. And then when I go out, talk to my boys before I leave, that is going to go help people. So we want to come with you. I want to come with you, dad. I want to help people too. It's like, you're helping people in me right now and you will come and help me with me, right? So with the humanitarian work that you've done, going to these impoverished companies, I, I checked out your Instagram and I was like, wow, this dude's done a lot of traveling and really boots on the ground helping mm-hmm. people. I often wonder with with that type of work, and I'm not really familiar with that. That hasn't been my avenue of service. But I think your films have illuminated that <laughs> there is a cause of this suffering mm-hmm. and these impoverished people and these indigenous peoples from around the world who have had their resources taken from them and have been enslaved and subjugated and exploited, right? Yeah. And sometimes I see like someone in another country, oh, I'm going to, you know, go teach English at the school or drop off bags of rice to the starving, you know, and it's like well-intentioned, but I often think like, yeah, but who are the baddies that are doing it? You know, mm. like we gotta, we gotta go after the, the root of the problem, yeah. not necessarily the, the symptom, you know, what, what have you found in terms of, you know, that hands-on actually one-on-one helping someone who's, who's in pain and, and loss and um, in need um, versus some of the work you've done where you start to look at the deeper levels of how these people have been exploited and, and who it is that's actually doing it. Yeah, so they're really good questions because it's, 
you kind of don't want to put a Band-Aid on the issue and just go in there and go, here's a little bit of food and then the corruption still gobbles that up at the end of the day. So you want to understand that. I remember uh, taking images of the famine in 2017 of when people literally died in my arms of, of starvation and I would take these images back to the... Um, the government officials as they're going in and out of parliament at the local parliament, I would show them the images that, and they would deny that this was happening. And so the interest there in the people was uh, typically not there. But on the other hand, it's, it's really not a lot different from what you're seeing in developed countries as well, the way that they're treating their, um, their people. But bird's eye view for me, the reason why I do what I do with that and why I think that people should know that there is so much power in their their views and what they do is because I think that everything operates on this principle of love, right? Where what motivation is that coming from? If it is coming from love, love always wins and it is, such, it is the pervasive force. And so if something is done and it appears to be good, but it's not motivated by love, that actually eventually or, or quite quickly comes to the surface. But when something is deeply motivated by love, there's a huge problem. People are suffering and then you know, people from other countries then surge into that issue. Like, you know, we'll, I, in, a, in the regions of Kenya that we're working in, uh, we're about to go through some major chapters of famine um, and people are emaciated just like they were back in 2017 with the work that we're doing in the three regions that we're working in. I believe that there's, there's potentially going to be, it'll be that not a single person dies of starvation because of the intervention. So the, at the, re, the reality at the end of the day is that it does work. And so, it, it sometimes just requires outside support and everyone's saying, well, I'm a, I'm a part of this and, and, and making a difference and being a part of it, not kind of asking for permission or seeing a boundary by a country of saying that's, that you've kind of compartmentalized them and said, well, that's their government's problem. But often the, the problems, even if the government's wanted to solve it, they don't have the resources. So you've got to just kind of think big. That's, yeah, I like that perspective. So especially the, the bit, if it's done out of love, then there's not really quantification of whether you're feeding one kid in need or you're creating a film that gets 11 million views that's exposing the, the network of sociopaths that are, you know, upstream from that problem that you see in the village, yeah. right? It's like, it's kind of all the same. I think that's yeah. the thing I wonder sometimes is like, ah, are you really doing any good? But it reminds me of that parable and I might not get it exactly right, but it's something to the effect that a bunch of crabs have washed up on the beach, right? And this man is, um, you know, walking down the, I mean, thousands of crabs, right? And they're all fit to die. This guy's walking down the beach and he's picking up one crab at a time and throwing them out to sea and saving their lives. And mm -hmm. another guy walks up and says, man, you know, look, you're not going to make a difference throwing like one crab at a time. Why do you bother trying to save, you know, 10 crabs lives? And he throws one out and he goes, ask that one if it mattered. Yeah. Right? Exactly. Something like that. It's know? always, yeah, exactly. So it's, and I think it's starfish. We'll let the audience like research it, it. <laughs> okay. because the starfish can't move away. Okay. He's like yeah, stuck with oh, the yeah, crab can right. rub back Crabs in. can just be like, I'm walking back in the ocean. Okay. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. But this, yeah. I think it's starfish, but, but the point is true either way. Yeah. Like, I mean, it's possible the crab is stuck and he needs help too. No, so. I totally had it wrong. Crabs can very easily walk back into the <laughs> starfish. I'm going to remember that. Yeah. Um, so let's dive into as delicately as we can, um, some of the topics that you've covered in your films, you know, maybe give us the names with some sort of, again, not for the podcast listeners, but more for the video element of this and the fact that we're live streaming sure. on these communist platforms. <laughs> so autoimmune secrets, depression, anxiety, and dementia secrets, natural medicine secrets. So like my, co my company health secret, we've kind of just used some of those titles, uh, new film that I'm working on, unbreakable destined to thrive it's all about people getting injuries from these supposed safe and effective things that are getting put into people and how severe those injuries have actually been and what we can do to understand the mechanism of why that's happening and how people can reverse these issues uh, which i believe that conversation comes from a place of love when people say i'm not willing just to let this person suffer we have to find answers and i'm willing to keep trying keep trying and so we've seen some really amazing um, data come out of that and that so we'll be revealing that um i worked with another group on a film called the truth about v a c c i n e s so about v's and truth about cancer and 
that was that was great working as a producer on that seeing some of the things that were coming in the future and we talked about that uh, like what was coming in 2020 we talked about that back in 2014 or 15 with the truth about b uh so uh, mandatory bees coming for ad- adults healthy people 2020 these things were being talked about as very surprising so it was very much a handbook so lots of the things that were unfolding uh we I and others saw them coming from a long time ago and it was like watching a train wreck in slow motion and feeling so sad that people were subjecting themselves to these things. Uh, there's a new, you know, this new film I'm releasing, Unbreakable, is talking about uh, a congressional hearing from 1975 where the CIA is showing that they had developed a heart attack gun that was using shellfish toxin and it could enter the subject without them knowing and it would cause a heart attack and it's all visible, disclosed. And the fact that these same types, and they disclosed that in the labs that was found, it said 19 different venoms and toxins. Wow. Including cobra venom. Oh my God. And this is verifiable. It was like not a theory. This is stated uh, exactly. outright. Was you could watch all the video footage from 1975, the congressional hearing with the director of the CIA uh, and and also the uh, senator, Frank Church, and they disclose uh, William Colby, the director of the CIA, shows the gun and they go through all the coordinates and the woman that designed it uh, or the found the shellfish toxin. Her name is Mary Embry. She was only 18 at the time working for the CIA and they asked her, they tasked her with this to find something that could enter a victim, create a heart attack without them knowing um, and be untraceable in autopsy and it's all public she discloses that information that she found that she had to leave the cia because she was so morally conflicted on what what she was a part of uh so that technology was developed and the surprising realities of what's coming up in people's bodies that are infected with this certain uh uh, virus is uh, a a peer-reviewed study that came out uh, in October of 2021 was showing that the people that were infected with this versus those that weren't had a combination of 36 different toxin-like peptides, almost identical to, and then it lists the venoms of different shellfish and snakes. And then it has a, in table one, it goes through all 36 different, uh, the, 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 the like Malayan crate or the Eastern brown snake or the coral snake or the conotoxin from the crown of thorn starfish. It goes into detail. And so how did these structures get into people? And so we start seeing, wow, is this, this, is this, this technology that was being used? Is this why it's so harmful? Is this why people can get such uh, visceral and vivid and life-threatening reactions in such short periods of time, which is unusual? Uh, and the, the death rates, the heart stopping, is this envenomation? So these are some questions I think people should wow. ask. Wow, wow, that's bananas. So yeah. going back to your earlier film where you're exploring the Vs in general, like childhood schedule Vs, yeah, these yeah, things, exactly. right? And you're, you're meeting these families and uh, families of children that have been injured and, and things like this. Um, in those scenarios, the injuries sometimes take place over the course of uh, larger periods of yeah, time, longer true. periods of time, right? And it's much harder to maybe trace that. So what you're saying is with what's being discovered in, in this case with the modern Vs, <laughs> of the, the Vs of the day is that um, traces of these other substances are showing up and that's why we're seeing sometimes these instantaneous uh, side effects. Exactly. Wow. Exactly. So it's a different technology and that's why we're seeing such uh, immediate reactions. And you'll see that in envenomation, uh, the people typically, if they're going to die from it, die within uh, two to three days. And then if you look at the data of the 27,000 27, deaths that have been reported uh, to VAERS, so that's mostly US-based, uh, or it's certainly a US-based system, and then most reports are from the US, or a bigger portion of them are, uh, over 50% of those happened within the first 48 hours, around that number. Uh, and then certainly 80% within the first 12 days. So that is, again, resembling what you would expect to see within venomation. Uh, again, those are things that are kind of just kind of linking things together and just seeing, does this kind of fit? But these other things that I was mentioning where it, the study that I referenced that was, you know, urine, fecal uh, samples, 
and plasma. So it was found in the, the samples, these uh, evidence of the toxin-like peptides, uh, almost identical to the venoms, which, which actually shows that it's not the actual venom, it's a peptide, a toxin-like peptide, which means that it's a replica of it. It's a copy that has been manufactured. It's synthetic, which means that it can be produced at scale, which actually makes a lot more sense. Uh, and so they're really concerning, but it brings up also uh, avenues for how people can get better as well, because then you understand how this protein is working in the body and you look at treatments, like it's interesting, the nicotinic receptors, people are finding... Um, uh, using uh, avenues like uh, chewing nicotine it, uh, is uh, creating a surge in the body to stimulate the body to to target that issue. I'm uh, chewing some right now, so yeah. I'm good. <laughs> it, it actually uh, it has pr- been proven to really? help. There was one woman. Uh, it was a Dr. Tor, uh, which which you know for me I would generally avoid nicotine, right? But I think that for particular purposes for your acute cases, that's exactly what I think these um, substances are available to us for, right? That's just just my view on it. But yeah, Dr. Tor uh, Braun worked for the uh, FBI. His specialty was in uh, preventing mass killings. And when he wrote to the FBI in July of last year saying this resembles what's happening with this big outbreak all resembles envenomation, and then one of the cases he brought up was when he explained the nicotinic receptors. And so I'm learning about it so that he, you know, people like him can explain it better than me. But he's talking about how either nicotine or the natural version would be bioparin, the bioavailable black pepper extract bioparin uh, it could be used instead. But um, this had, he had a case where the woman had long COV ID and she had lost her hearing in her right ear. And after eight days of chewing uh, the nicotine, she completely got her hearing back. And so we see these cases, which is kind of proving this theory of that this is coming from envenomation. Uh, But more so, I think the bigger picture is uh, looking at how your body breaks down proteins. And this is where enzymes come in and fasting. Um, autophagocytosis is the process where your body is going into a state where it's clearing out, breaking down proteins, clearing out toxins out of the body. And so when people are fasting for um, you know, three days, they, they deepen this state. And if they're taking enzymes that are proteolytic, meaning that they break down proteins like seropeptase or bromelain, uh, and they're taking them periodically on an empty stomach and it's breaking down the proteins. And then we're seeing people get into remission or to turn around their symptoms after taking one of these injections that has harmed them and then we're seeing them recover uh, function. So one of the medic, uh, naturopathic doctors that I've been working with, Dr. Henry Ely, has now seen eight of his patients that have been injured um, severely from this and then seen every single one of them have dramatic improvement using this. At this point in time, I'm sure it's not going to be you know, every single person. Sometimes it takes more trial and error. But, you know. As someone who spends so much time, energy, and money to be healthy, I want to keep track of what's working and what's not. That's why I'm really into this company I found called Inside Tracker. They are an ultra personalized performance system that analyzes data from your blood, DNA, lifestyle, and fitness tracker to help you optimize your body and reach your health and wellness goals. Through their app and testing protocol, I'm able to get a clear picture of what my body looks like on the inside. And I also get a clear measure of whether my diet, supplement, and exercise choices are helping or even hurting. I did the whole inside tracker deal recently and was actually shocked to find that I was less than perfect in some areas. My cholesterol and B vitamins were high, for example, and a few other things that need a little tweaking. There was, of course, also some good news as my overall health score was that of a much younger person and certainly more optimized than your average American. And that's the point. The whole goal with Inside Tracker is to be optimized, not normal. So they don't merely show you the normal biomarker zones. They show you the optimal biomarker zones and numbers that are best for your individual body. So if you want to check this out, I highly recommend you sign up for Inside Tracker now. You're going to get your testing done, the results of your biomarkers, and then some incredible lifestyle and diet recommendations from their Brainiac scientists to help you improve everything you find. 
Just go to insidetracker.com slash Luke, where you will save 25% off your entire order. That's insidetracker.com slash Luke. Apart from the film that you're working on now, wherein some of these recovery strategies are going to be laid out, is there um, an aggregate of this information anywhere that we could link to in the show notes or anything like that? I, I yeah, ask totally. because I get so many questions from people. Oh, my my mom had to get the thing because of her job or, you know, we wanted to travel. So we reluctantly submitted and got the thing and now we're having symptoms. What can we take? And, you know, I've heard some things here and there that are um, perhaps useful, but it's all kind of just piecemeal, right? You're like, yeah. oh, I heard this thing and I heard that thing, but... There's not like, you know, kind of a, a formula of do all this stuff and exactly. you, know, you could get better. Well, I'm glad you asked about that. One of my friends, Dr. Henry Ely, he did, thank God, put it all up, you know, free for people to download and uh, do that. And I can tell you the website. Do you want me to mention yeah, that? Yeah, right? please. Yeah, we'll yeah, put it in the show notes. Yeah, yeah. beyond the con. So beyond okay. the con dot com. <laughs> okay, I love that. Yeah. And then free resources. And then he has okay. the categories of immune priming. So he encourages people to do the 11 days of immune priming. And then do the three days of uh, water fasting, which is you scroll down the page and there'll be post-inoculation. And so he'll talk about taking L-arginine or NAC, liquid iodine, and dosages. He actually has that there, which is cool. great. Okay. And that's the exact protocol that he used. One of the guys got six Vs in one day and the CV. Um, and he was, I say, I'm not smiling on this. He was so injured that he couldn't basically stand up uh so neuro such neurological damage and so that also caused concussion because he felt he kept falling over and he banged his head really bad and so and he he was declining fast and dr ely said i i've seen patients that have died before and he looked like he was just about to die and so he used the protocol that i just mentioned and he's i was like well, how's he doing? He's like, he's back to normal. I'm like, well, does he realize? And he said, I don't think he really realizes how severe his situation was. But I mean, he's excited to be back to normal. He's back to work and everything. Like things, wow, yeah, cool. quit his job kind of thing. And or, yeah. or you know, I think he's off to work for like two weeks, but he got, you know, was back. Or it, something that you'd think someone would be out of the game. So kind of exciting. Wow, incredible resource. Thanks. And yeah. uh, for those listening too, we'll put the, the general show notes for this episode. Uh, let's call it lukestory.com slash Auto, O T T O. That's yeah. the spelling, yeah, correct? Yeah, yeah. yeah. LukeStory.com slash auto. So you guys don't have to take notes or stop your car and get in an accident. Like, we'll yeah. just put everything we talk about there. Um, and hopefully it survives, <laughs> survives the mm. internet <laughs> bots that come out. Of <laughs> well, thank you for caring enough, man. You, you're so practical. Like, I love that you care enough about your audience to say, hey, what, what do we do? Instead yeah. of just staying inside of something that would maybe just be the entertaining aspects. But thank you for caring about people. I mean, that that's oh, everything man. right now. Yeah. I mean, I also believe that there's a solution for everything too, you know, as, as dark and intimidating as this whole thing has been for so many of us. You know, so many people have been harmed in so many different ways, apart from even experimenting on themselves, whether voluntarily or not. Um, just the alcoholism, the yeah. mental abuse, the... Uh, domestic abuse, the traumatized children from wearing these things on their faces, you know, the whole thing. So I have a lot of compassion for humanity in general. And, you know, as I said earlier, I'm, I'm trying to get this information out without nuking my whole platform, you know, to save one person, <laughs> you know, it's like, because mm. there's a lot of information I share that has nothing to do with any of this. It's about consciousness and spirituality, yeah. and ways that we can hopefully um, help elevate our consciousness as a as a shared collective mm. uh, to a place where perhaps we don't even have this experience anymore. So wow. it's, it's kind of a dance for me to f find where I want to try to um, get it in and not. Which is uh, very thoughtful, man. So my hat's off and I yeah, really do appreciate well, likewise. That. I mean, Thank likewise you. for what you're doing. Um, so the thing I find curious about this illness in general and also the proposed solution in general is that people tend to react to it so differently. Like take the, yeah. the experimental solution that's rolled out over the past couple of years. I know people personally that I care about deeply that did it and are fine. Yeah. And then I know other people, well, you know, removed by a few people from myself who have literally died from doing it. And, you know, all these soccer players just boom, 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 one after another. Yeah. I mean, it's just like, what? And I, I think that's 
that's one of the really strange things about it. And I've often wondered, you know, are there like just vials of placebo, like saline that, you know, there's batches going out that are just nothing. Mm -hmm. And then there's batches that are going out that are potentially very harmful, as you describe. I mean, why do you think it is that some people are totally fine and some people aren't? Or is it just that some people are more biologically susceptible or have weaker immune systems or something that are making them, um, you know, fall ill sooner or to a greater degree? Yeah, no, that's, they're really good questions. And I've been scratching my head about that for, you know, the past you know, two years uh, or year and a half or so. And I think uh, some of the keys to think about there that provide some of the solutions to those questions would be certainly comorbidities. Um, studies done, for example, with the theory that I was mentioning about envenomation is to do with the fact that when a snake strikes a mouse that has, that has become diabetic based on other exposures that they've intentionally given that rat to create that condition, they die versus those that don't um, they don't die uh, particularly you know in certain circumstances with certain um, you know venom and they like they run these experiments so certainly predispositions are a big deal and then you have these cases of people being completely healthy and that explains you know it's it's a situation where you see that you can be completely healthy and you get stung by something and you know, whether like you look at Steve Irwin who got stung by the stingray and it, it didn't matter that he was a really healthy, fit person, that that's the effect of toxins and poisons in the body when they're at such high dosages. It does vary. Uh, for example, we know it's varied because one of the reasons is when you open the, the label, when you, if you would ask the pharmacist and you would find the whole, it, it folds out, keeps folding out, folding out. It's like, this big and there's nothing written on it blank oh, both sides it's <laughs> to, to just just to be devil's advocate kind of yeah, on the please. other side of the issue like i have a hard time understanding because we're going into some kind of conspiratorial territory it is a little bit, I, yeah. I acknowledge that um and you know i don't know that you're right or that i'm right i'm just asking questions yeah i'm, I like I'm a curious guy but even someone who was say very you know pro medical system pro quotes science why would that not raise alarm for someone that you're in some cases being coerced if not almost forced into taking a medication <laughs> in, in, in which there are n no listed side effects or any ingredients or anything in the insert i mean if i go to rite aid right now to buy some cold medicine i mean i'm going to pull out that little insert and it's way too much to read but the information is there and yeah. one could assume somewhat accurate right so i can kind of have informed consent and go oh, you know, possible side effects dizziness nausea diarrhea and it has all these ingredients that i can't pronounce but i got the sniffles i'm going to take it we're talking about something that is it's an injection something that is shrouded in controversy already right i mean even before the advent of this latest version of it but just childhood schedules of these yeah. injections and all the things it's like i don't understand how even a rational person who doesn't believe that there has ever been a conspiracy of ill intention humans harming other humans at any point in history wouldn't look at just that one fact and go okay hang on hold up what you know and yeah. there are so many touch points like that where I, I really try to remove myself from my biases because i i have them like many of us do yeah we totally do but there are things like that i'm just like put myself in in a contrarian thinker's brain how could i not go right, hold on you know that alone is insane not to mention you know lack of safety studies and trials and you know we are the trial right yeah um, so anyway, that's just in, insane to me that, and, and also that someone would be like, oh, the thing's blank, meh, the TV told me it's okay. I'll do it. I mean, like, wow, I take some pretty big risks, I think in my life at times, especially in the past, but even I would be like, hey, whoa, yeah, this sounds a little scary. But wouldn't it be nice to just trust? You know what I mean? Wouldn't that be just a nice feeling to, to believe that you could trust and that every these authorities had your best interest in mind and this was going to be really good for you and it was completely going to be safe. And 
I mean, even just yeah. me thinking about that, I'm like, wow, like this is just like everything is like beautiful <laughs> and shiny. I, it's, an, it's a nice thought. Unicorns and rainbows. Yeah. Well, if, it's that, kind if, of, it, if that was the case, Jonathan, then what we would have seen from the beginning of this was like, okay, everyone exercise, mm -hmm. take your vitamins, uh, eat organic, get out in the sun, you know, like yeah. we would have seen some messaging that could actually support people, but that messaging was completely omitted from the official recommendations. But what if I don't want to exercise? What if I don't want to pay money for supplements? What if I don't want to? So it it's actually a very attractive message to me that I don't have oh, to do anything. Right. I don't have to do you all that stuff. I don't have to life. eat healthy. I don't want to have to waste, waste money on organic food and buy these things and put them in me. I just All I have to do is go here and get this incentive and I get a free donut. Oh, right. And it's so, it's so sad because it's... It's, you're getting allured with something and it's so attractive and it, it would be great to feel that way. I remember looking at Krispy Kreme donut if you go get this thing and I don't even eat Krispy Kreme donuts, but I just wanted it for a second. It's just like, oh, why do I want this right now? I just felt like I was getting allured into something. And so obviously I didn't do it, but you know. Um, I think with topics like this and, and some of the other stuff we can cover about, about your films, um, I think a big stretch for people is to come to acknowledge that there are groups of people or conglomerates or corporations or systems as a whole that are so driven with the thirst of power, oh, yeah. uh, money, whatever they're driven by, that they would knowingly and sometimes intentionally harm or kill large swaths of people. This is very difficult for some of us to comprehend, hence the, um, you know, the denial and kind of the cognitive dissonance. Mm. And I think the people that have the hardest time maybe opening themselves to that possibility are people who are caring, loving, kind people yeah. who are not sociopaths, mm -hmm. therefore lack the ability to put themselves in the shoes of a sociopath who is motivated by those motives because they're not. They're a good person. <laughs> Right? Yeah, yeah. It's like the people who are good, trusting, loving, kind people are the most easily victimized because they can't imagine that there are people on the planet that wish to harm them yeah. for whatever motive. But do you think those people are very aware of their shadow? Hmm. Perhaps not. Let's explore that. Yeah. So, for example, like if I said to you, hey, you know, don't you think the world's overpopulated? And, you know, I mean, a lot of people today and some of the people that are making these choices or like kind of not everyone, but particularly the people that are forcing their loved ones to make choices that are coercing them into something. My experience has been, I've asked them questions like that about the world being overpopulated or something like that. And they will be like, yeah, it's super overpopulated. And, and again, like maybe, maybe it is. I, I mean, my research shows me that it's absolutely underpopulated. Cities are overpopulated typically. Uh, not all cities, a lot of cities. But so then if it's overpopulated, what do we do to solve this problem? And is there going to be a food shortage? Well, then it looks like there might be something coming like that. And so shouldn't we be proactive and help lessen the world's population in order to prevent greater suffering? But who gets to be the one that bites the bullet? And who gets the one to make that decision? Mm-hmm. But back to your comment about have those people explored their shadow. Yeah. So do you mean perhaps that someone who is a kind, altruistic, caring person that can't imagine that evil exists you know, in that way or that it would perpetuate in that way because they haven't looked at those parts in themselves that are hungry yeah. for power and money and all of the things? So they're, they're not only in denial of that... Um, outside of themselves, but also within themselves? Yeah, exactly. And the, th and the theme that I mentioned is basically the, the sociopathic, uh, godlike decision maker that actually in their own mind sentences the world to death anyway, in just in the thought of believing there's not enough. And if there's not enough, then it's kill or be killed. And so you're indoctrinated with it. And so it, you're in that shadow just like that. Or in the case that you're talking about, it was the same kind of theme in my mind, is that you are, you're actually unaware of these characteristics in yourself 
And so, uh, but yet you entertain yourself with them in movies. Uh, like how much death is even in like a film that's not even considered violent, but the storyline is catered to you because you're the one that pays money for it. So the storyline could end any way that it wanted to, to kind of create ticket sales. And so why don't the bad guys at the end of the movies fall to their knees, repent to God, change, become good people and right their wrongs. And then everyone goes, what a great movie. Why does the bad guy have to die? And, you know, so I just, I see these realities of, and the things that people sentence people to death for are, are, are insane, like a Jurassic Park film. Like, I mean, what do you have to do to be deserving of being eaten by a dinosaur in those films? Well, you, if you're overweight, if you're eating donuts, if you're greedy, you look at the characteristics, they highlight these characteristics, and then you sit there as God deciding that those characters deserve to die. And so if you have a darkened view like this, you believe that punishment is needed and that you know, people deserve this. And so you kind of, in your mind, you believe it's some kind of sacrifice for the greater good. So some people are going to succumb and it's, it's normal. It's, it's, it's a necessary reality. So it's like um, from the powers that be that are perpetuating harm on humanity, there's a justification there in that according to their omniscient point of view or mm-hmm. self-imposed omniscience that it's for the greater good. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's like every sort of regime that's come in and caused mass suffering and destruction. It's for the greater good. I mean, that's always the yeah. thing. Uh, yeah. We got to, yeah, a few people over here are going to die and suffer, but in the end, we're all going to reap the benefits of it. I mean, this is always kind of how communism begins, right? Sure. And then devolves into mass suffering and war and death and all those things. Yeah, absolutely. If people understand that sacrifice is deeply written into the what what the Bible would describe as like a carnal nature, what what just shows up in humanity that these things happen and people find normal ways to justify them and make sense of them, but it's like an offering or a sacrifice because something has to be made to settle the the challenges that we feel inside of ourselves. For example, uh, we all know that we've screwed up in life and made mistakes. And so how do, you, how do you correct that? And so seeing somebody else meet their doom actually solves, you know, completes the loop in your own mind that that has been punished and the whole issue has been resolved. And so this is what drove me to watch films that had violent themes in them. As soon as I solved this issue in my mind, I no longer had those feelings that punishment was necessary. I started hating those films and it was like, it made me want to vomit seeing things like that that I used to love, but it was all because of the turmoil. Right. I mean, so we're we're sort of observing the acting out of <laughs> these things going on subconsciously. Because I, I wonder that too. Like over the years, I've developed a, a much um, higher aversion to violent oh, that's cool. films and shows. But I didn't decide like, oh, that's wrong. I don't. I shouldn't watch that. It's just like, oh God, it just affects me more. Wow. So you know, like I remember. Um, I was dating someone years ago that loved The Walking Dead. And I was like, I don't like violent shows. And, you know, I kind of, just to appease her and share some time with her, I started watching The Walking Dead, which is an interesting show. I mean, it's a pretty good freaking zombie show. And it's like, it made me sick, yet I was still compelled, beyond her just wanting to share that experience with me, yeah. I was still compelled to keep watching it. And I'm like, every time I feel hungover and just gross afterward from yeah. just seeing all of this, even though it's pretend, your subconscious doesn't know it's pretend blood and guts sure. and, and just killing, 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 killing. And, you know, finally I was able to stop because the the repercussions of that. But, you know, I wonder what it's it is. It's good you could see that. I'm going to take a moment to ask you something. How often do you wake up in the morning and instantly wish you had just one more hour of sleep? You know, you hit the snooze button and hope next time your alarm goes off, you feel more energized. Well, I get messages from people all the time specifically asking for brain solutions. So they usually mention things like brain fog, low energy, poor focus, and so on. Well, I recently found a truly incredible solution to all of this called Newtopia. They specialize in personalized brain supplements known as nootropics. Taking this stuff is like flicking a switch and turning your brain on within the first 10 minutes of waking up in the morning and feeling totally engaged, focused, upbeat, and productive no matter what life throws at you. I actually had my dose of nootopia this morning and I'm feeling quite focused and perky. 
And I've experienced this effect over the past few months since trying Newtopia. These guys have legit created the most advanced brain support and cognitive enhancement system that I've ever tried. And uh, I've tried a lot of them. It's kind of like a do not disturb feature for your brain. And unlike other products in this category, there are no crashes, jitters, or side effects. I'm actually shocked that these formulas work so well without making me feel uptight and tweaked out, which is often the case with things that can be stimulating to the brain. So I highly recommend the Newtopia system for anybody looking to take their focus, creativity, and mood to a new level. So to turn your brain on, go to newtopia.com slash Luke and enter the coupon code Luke10 for an extra 10% off. That's N-O-O-T-O-P-I-A. These guys are so confident that their stuff works. They also stand by their products with a 365-day money-back guarantee. So this is a no-brainer for your brain. Again, that's newtopia.com slash Luke. And the coupon code is Luke10 for an extra 10% off. I wonder what it is in our nature that even against our sort of higher understanding or intuition, we're still compelled to engage in, you know, violent films and pornography and things like that that might have a deleterious effect to our well-being. And we know that it does, yet there's this addictive sort of pull and drive to it. Yeah, no, you got it. I, And that is a profound question, I think, because if people solve that, then they find that because any of us, like if any addiction to watching anything would just, you know, there's only so many hours in the day. I've got two young children. It'd be great for me to love playing with my children more than I love watching anything, let alone something violent, right? And, you know, what is the drive? Why do we, why are we entertained by themes like that instead of themes that would be the opposite, like someone being loved and cared for or somebody that has um, flaws of character that are detestable? But like loving that character still and seeing that person come to a place of contentment and fulfillment. And, you know, the bad guys, like, I mean, shouldn't there be some movies or the stories of the bad guys and then seeing, you know, why do we hate them? Like they had things that happened to them in their childhood and let's, you know, let's love them. But I think it's this concept that, um, that forgiveness is not a possibility. And I didn't realize this in my natural human nature I'm not forgiving at all. And I'm the absolute opposite. And this was killing my marriage. I know it. And so I you know, came to a point where my wife and I, we were better judges to each other than we were lovers. And because everything, I, and for me, my description of it is kind of like what I was mentioning before, of feeling that punishment was due to me without me realizing I would never have put words to it. I'd be like, what do you mean? Like, that sounds crazy. I'm so deeply subconscious. I'm saying whether you're religious or not, I'm saying that this is playing out and it, evidences of that are in themes like these ones. Like you could, you could fill your mind with anything. Why, why do these themes entertain you? It's an evidence of what's in the soul. It certainly was for me. And then, so if there is a belief that punishment is due to you, which is interesting that Christianity is very much put forward a view of God like that. But a lot of religions really have, if you look at it, uh, it, even the belief of karma says that you've done something in a previous life that is the reason why you're crippled in this life. So there's punishment due to you because of sins of a previous life. That's the negative side of karma. Like the other side of karma that people reference, which would be seen as a more positive view of it would be that when you do bad things to people, it comes back to you, which kind of... uh, yeah, it helps encourage you not to do bad things. But this other side of karma caused people to commit suicide and you know, children and people that are crippled uh, by something, they get treated as though they're wicked people and in, in some of these countries. Uh, so, but, but yeah, this whole belief that we should be punished um, to me just totally breaks people's hold of being able to even understand God's love or source and feeling love and being having that completeness and then it creates a need for punishment and that all these things, everything needs to be punished. And some of the things I mentioned were like, they can be wicked things. Like for example, if somebody does something really evil in a movie and they keep doing these terrible evil things, what do you want to happen to these characters? Oh man, you want to see them killed. Yep. Slowly and, and painfully. There you go. Exactly. So it gets more it's 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 very much that's the sense of justice it has to be more drawn out to that more graphic i'm not even kidding either i yeah. just like a gut reaction i thought about it no because like if if you watch this this villain perpetuating crimes yeah. and, and harm and all the things 
And then like he just gets shot and falls down. You're like, ah, come on. He deserved way more than that. Exactly. Right? Exactly. And and so, and it's such a dark position because if we had a court of law act like that, and it would be like sentenced to like five days of torture, you'd just be like, we just woke up in horror. When did this world become dystopic? I'm living in hell. This is terrible. Like it would feel really eerie to think that that was the sentence, right? Right? I mean, unless you, you know, find like, no, that's great. It was really bad what he did. Five days of torture sounds just, just right. But some people would be like that. Like, so I'm saying it would, be, it would be jarring, but there'd be part of all of people that would say, okay, that's what's due to them. And I'm saying that this is a very dark um, issue that it's, and it's nothing, it, it appears to be godly because it's like a punisher of, of evil. It appears to be like Christian or something like this, godly, good, but it's actually the opposite. It's like a, it's like a fake, it's a mirage. It's, and it, and it's uh, because it never offers redemption. And, and, and I, and so to answer it, where it's coming from is the fact that I believe that we all fundamentally don't believe we can be forgiven for the things that we've done. And so that punishment is due to us, whether it's a little thing or a great thing. And so we live under that weight because we're all sticklers. When we come down to it, when we exact with people and why we don't like somebody or how we're angry at our partner, our spouse, and it's, you did this and you did this and you did this and we've itemized it all out. Like you've hurt me in this way and you need to pay and you need to, you know, I'm angry with you. And so, but then if the penalty is gone, then it's, then it's, then there's a beautiful reality where you, you offering space for people to heal. And so, I, yeah, it's changing the view of it, what if there, what if God doesn't operate or, you know, universe doesn't operate on principles of punishment. It's just not even written into the law of nature. Consequence is natural. So you do, you you make choices and then consequence happens, but it's not imposed against you. It's not God saying, I'm going to kill you if you do this. It's saying, if you do this, you'll be departing from uh, uh, the way. And so therefore suffering is is there, but it's not me causing this and I'm here and I'm suffering with you through it. Yeah, ever since I switched this, I started thinking differently about people. I stopped gossiping about people. I I stopped attacking my wife or it then became, it would kind of rarely come up. And then when it would come up, I'd be like, oh, that's what I just done. I'm sorry. Like, I just, I'm, I'm learning, right? And it was just a different kind of feeling, right? When you uh, explore these realms in, in, you know, of kind of, the duality, the dichotomy of good versus evil, and you're having to spend some time learning about and exploring and uncovering these truths, right? Your films are revealed in truth. I mean, you're digging, you're doing like investigative journalism. Um, how do you sort of remove yourself emotionally from the negativity porn, the, the fear oh, yeah. porn? You know, it's like, I find myself sometimes teetering on wanting to know what's going on, seeing how I might be able to add value and provide a perspective or help or just be in the know. I think generally humans like me, I'm very curious. I want to know the ultimate truth in any situation. So mm -hmm. if I feel I or we are being deceived or lied to, lied to, I want to get through the center of that and yeah. find what's really going on. It's just the way I'm wired. But in so doing you're kind of, you know, dancing with the devil, so to speak. You, ha you have to expose yourself to some things that are emotionally dysregulating and ugly. And there is a certain, like those violent films that you don't want to watch, but you do. I think in alternative media and, you know, looking at the cabal and the Illuminati and all of the things, you know, in the conspiracy world, there's also like a certain addictive draw to that. Yeah. And it's this razor's edge of like wanting to kind of have my finger on the pulse of what is possibly happening from different perspectives to kind of know but to do so you have to see what's happening yeah true. and there's this darkness that pervades that space mm. um that i think many people feed off you know this QAnon and all this kind of really out there shit that's like such fantasy mm -hmm. and it's negative dark fantasy true. you know true so as a filmmaker how have you navigated these sort of murky waters and still maintained your sense of center and, and emotional integrity within yourself. Yeah. So I appreciate you asking that because it's interesting. Certain, certain things I've studied go back to like 20 years ago 
And and I remember myself getting kind of sack, sucked into some rabbit holes and just feeling like this desire to punish, right? So I'd learn things and then I'd be kind of wishing death upon the oppressors, which is very negative because you're still operating. For me, I was operating outside of love and I was kind of like a vigilante, like I want justice, a Batman kind of image about combating evil. But for me, I think there's really only one way to overcome evil and it's with love and light. And, and, but it's very hard to feel that when you feel so much animosity for the evil that somebody has done and you've kind of painted a picture of them in your mind and you kind of, they've become your scapegoat and you've lumped all your sins upon them and you want to offer them up as a sacrifice. So I think that that's literally what I was doing. <laughs> So that is the issue I think that people and that we fundamentally face that like everything, when you think about it, we're all offering people up as, as a sacrifice. It's like, it's our sacrificial lamb. It's, it's this president or it's this president. And we just, we love, we, we do it through mockery or we do it through um, like avid criticism, uh, through uh, insult, through anger. And, you know, we're wishing death upon these characters or like the people that are running this covert operation, the cabal, the globalists. And then it's like the sting of death of just meditating a, an ill end of these people when it's such a dark place to live in. Like, it, you know, I'm a, a husband and father. I need all the light and love I can get to be kind to my wife when she's doesn't know how to be kind with me. And when I don't know how to be kind with her, she needs to you know, navigate that. And with my children, I have to be so patient. So these cultivating these things uh, become then very problematic. And so sometimes the more that people know, I've noticed how many friends people lose, right? The more that they know, they seem to lose more friends, but it's because they haven't dealt with this fundamental justice system that they operate within that causes them to then a sacrifice people because they don't understand or because they hold an alternate view and they can't hold space for them and just say, hey, look, that totally makes sense why you see it that way and why you feel that way. And thank you for sharing that with me. I'm not going to hear, like, I'm not going to crucify you on this issue just because you see it differently. Like being able to hold space like that. But there's a cool like verse in, uh, that Paul writes about where he says, I'd have you wise concerning things that are good and simple concerning things that are evil. So I think that there's a certain depth that we kind of, we know things, but then you don't want to be like, oh, here's Jonathan, he's a philosopher of evil. He understands evil to the depths and understands every dimension of evil. You'd want Jonathan to be the, the discerner of light and love, and he understands the dimensions of love. That's the power, because when you think about it, which is the one that is powerful enough to break evil? Does evil get broken with more evil being pointed out and railed against and be like, look at this and mockery and hatred towards it and chastising it? Or is it deep love? Like, and you see examples of this in when, when the most hardened criminals become soft-hearted and they change. And you see these examples. And it, what was it that created that? Was it, would, did they get beaten to a pulp in prison? That like, so they woke up after a beating like, I, I'm going to be loving. They would something happened where they were either deeply loved by someone or by God and they went through that change. And so that is the only thing that I think can initiate the change. I like how the lighting just <laughs> changed dramatically <laughs> right in that moment. Yeah. And God said, yeah. lights off. Yeah. Well, this is something I work with within myself because from, from perhaps the highest perspective I can reach within, within myself I see the possibility, this is going to sound weird, so I'm going to try to articulate it, that at a base level, everyone is innocent. Yeah. The George Soros, the Mussolini, the Hitler, the Mao, like the people that the animal self is like, I want to see them tortured yeah. and die slowly, right? Mm -hmm. um, revenge, all of that, the condemnation and the, and the self-righteousness of like, well, I would never do that, therefore, oh, yeah. right? It's such a good line, right? But each of these perpetrators of what one could deem evil or wrong is in each moment literally doing what they believe to be the best move yeah right and and also it's likely that they've been harmed like you mentioned people getting harmed in childhood yeah. and the repercussions of that you know all these serial killers i mean it's like all generally come from trauma people that are really psychologically 
ill, um, have been scarred, um, you know, yeah. perhaps beyond repair. So it's like, okay, if everyone ultimately is innocent and not to condone behavior that harms others, but just as a soul, that's a soul who's at a certain stage of evolution that is of a, a lesser understanding, right? And so their version of doing what's right is like assisting in 9-11 or yeah. <laughs> invading this country or that country uh, or you know, rolling out a medication that's terribly dangerous and harmful to people, et cetera. It's like they're innocent in that they're doing what they believe to be the right thing and maybe believe to be for the greater good or have you know some distorted vision of um, of of their behavior and action being of a higher mind right yeah. like they're they're not actually intentionally harming people, but they have a a misguided perception of, of yeah. what would harm someone. It's okay, they're innocent on that level, and if I can surrender my desire to punish them and hurt them and seek yeah. revenge. And like, where in there do we find just justice, right? Yeah. You know, then how do we stop them also without having hate in our hearts? Like, how do how does love stop stop evil? Stop? Yeah, you know exactly. what I'm getting I, at? I, I love that, and I think it's only by love can we stop the evil. But then it does mean action, and it depends in in what because. Uh, various people maybe some people are called to prayer and that prayer actually does make change I, and i i do believe that you everyone listening has some understanding of the power of the mind and intention and and it, so you know does the world collectively praying for a better reality praying for people in places of power you know does this make a difference i'm saying yeah yeah i, I believe so and the reason why i say love is if love is underpinning it's very exhausting to be in a state like, I mean, you, you could think about the parasympathetic uh, nervous system, what's going on when we're in a state of anger. Like it is like a firecracker. It will burn out and you'll give up pretty quickly. You'll be so angry that you just, all you want to do is like punch holes in the wall and then you can't really do much with that energy, but love like allows you to hold someone to it. And it's interesting that if you hold somebody to something, it's actually the only way to save that person. Like, what if your whole mission was to try and save some of these mass, you know, if you believe they're mass genocidists or whatever, that you can't do that without holding them to the truth. And that may mean the criminal prosecution and jail service. But then what about, what about jail time? How should that be run? Should, you know, should there be prison reform? Should there be a chaplain in that prison? You see what I mean? It's just like, how do you think about things and then but, and act in love, but still know that that love will then dictate change yeah that's beautiful man yeah. um god thank you so much for joining me today i feel like we have another two hours in us but they're turning off the lights and security <laughs> is starting to poke their head in the door this makes it and i want to thank you so much for dropping in with me today thank you, and luke. uh i really would like to have another conversation i would love you. that same thank you so much luke i appreciate and it and we'll put everything we talked about and your links and all of that in the show notes for people at lukestory.com slash auto t-o-t-t-o I've literally never met anyone in my life who doesn't like a little sex from time to time. In fact, some folks like it a lot of the time. The thing is that for men, their physical readiness is an important part of making this happen. Remember the last time you were at the gas station and you saw on the counter those horribly branded erection pills? Did you ever take a second to see what's actually in those products? They are terrible for you, just super toxic. And the same goes for most of the medication on the market that claims to help men in the bed, but who wants a four-hour erection, nasty side effects, heart problems, and a possible trip to the hospital to get rid of that thing? Well, luckily for me and maybe some of the men listening, I recently found this really cool product called Joy Mode that fills this gap. It's a performance booster, much like a pre-workout, but for sex. It's really cool. Joy Mode's gig is that they make natural and science-backed sexual wellness supplements for men. Their sexual performance booster is designed to support erection quality and firmness and sex drive. It contains clinically supported doses of L-citrulline, arginine, yohimbine, and vitamin C. To get yourself primed with the old joy mode, all you do is tear open the sachet and mix it with a glass of water, just like your favorite electrolytes. And uh, about 45 minutes later, it's going to be magic time. You'll notice better blood flow, better erection quality and firmness, and increased sexual energy and drive. 
I've actually taken this product myself many times. And uh, frankly, I was shocked that it actually worked and provided zero side effects. Do you gentlemen want to spice things up in the bedroom and boost your sexual performance? And do you want to do it naturally without those nasty prescription drugs? Well, we've got a special offer for lifestylist listeners right here. Go to usejoymode.com slash Luke and enter the code Luke at checkout for 20% off your first order. That's usejoymode.com slash Luke. So a funny thing happened uh, in our recording yesterday. We were, we were right at the pinnacle of something, I think, quite powerful and you know, adding some hope and positivity at the yeah. end of an episode that was covering some pretty racy stuff and some things that could have instigated uh, you know, fear or doubt or even anger within some of the listeners. And then uh, you know, we got cut off. And I thought, ah, I felt like we were just about to tie a bow on it. So thank you for sitting down uh, after a 24-hour intermission <laughs> yeah. and coming back. Uh, I think where we left off was around the idea of finding a deeper level of forgiveness for uh, you know the humans on earth that are perpetuating harm on other people, mm. um, reconciling the shadow within ourselves that seeks to punish, yeah. and managing to do that while still putting ourselves in the position to affect positive change. Yeah, that's well said. Right? Some, yeah. Something around that. And yeah. I, I just feel like, oh, we were like really onto something quite quite special there, and uh, and then we lost it. So pick us back up where you feel would be most relevant to the last part of the conversation. Sure, Luke. Well, I think that the exact thing that you're talking about is the most beautiful dichotomy to me because you're talking about very important things, like justice in the sense of right, um, that aspect of what can we do to have a better future and to see that people uh, are not allowed to perpetuate suffering, uh, to inflict evils upon people, and this is celebrated or tolerated. This needs to be dealt with, but then how do we deal with it? And, and then how do we approach that? Because, and that we mentioned about the judicial system and what is prison for? Is it to say, bad boy, you're punished. And so is it to try to meet with an equal and opposite reaction to what you've done? Well, let's do this to you. Let's punish you for this. So it's very natural to think this way. If somebody commits a heinous crime, it would then make sense. Well, if they have murdered someone, then they deserve to be killed. But then a lot of people feel that capital punishment doesn't, it creates more of a dystopic society. It's, it's not what you want. It's premeditated murder. Uh, should we have governments premeditating murder? Does it, is it justified? You know, so then, then you, then you pierce through that and you start asking the questions, well, what is that thing called prison reform? It, that's, that's all to do with using, prison is to say there's something wrong here. This person is in, they have problems. They have issues. There's some countries in the world where the, the greatest life sentence you can serve is 20 years because they don't, they believe in a different type of model where that the reform can take place in that time. Uh, you know, I can't vouch for that. I don't, don't, don't know, know enough about it, but I can vouch for the fact that when people take into this, this mindset of what can we do to, to solve this problem and get the person the help that they need, there's movies like Just Mercy. Did you ever see that one? Mm -hmm. It was uh, John, uh, Michael B. Jordan. That name might ring a bell, but he, he plays this attorney, but he's, he's with all these criminals on death row and then you really start to empathize with them and even the one that has committed a murder you can see that he was a vietnam veteran he was out of his mind when he was doing it and you, it's the one where you know i couldn't even watch that scene it was so horrific because the his actual actual execution was there and then the attorney is witnessing it and he goes and vomits after it because it's 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 so traumatizing for him to have experienced this and then the other guys in prison before the night before his execution they're saying to him uh, he's saying well i deserve this and i should never have done this how did i kill this person i set a bomb up and blew it's a true story by the way uh, it's all based on a true story and then they say to him you were sick in the head you are you have you have problems. You need help. You need a psychiatrist. You need a 
they're talking like this to him, trying to reassure him that don't give up on yourself, even though they're about to judge you to your death and don't believe it still. You know, it was just so profound. But you, you start to see these themes and realize, what if there is a better way? And so when you think like that, then it's not that you don't believe in the judicial system and that you don't believe in doing these things. I think the big problem is people sitting at home wishing these people would, would die. And I think that that's just so toxic and they don't realize how poisonous it is to their soul because that's not what we're trying to do here. Yeah, and also something I've looked at because I, as I think I mentioned in, our, in, in the beginning of our conversation yesterday was I've caught myself vilifying these characters, the Bill Gates, the George Soros, Klaus Schwab, you know, these kind of super, these literally like super villains out of a comic book. You know what I mean? It's just, you can't, you can't make it up. They literally are like out of a movie from my perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and I found myself just going, you know, like, why hasn't anyone taken this guy out? You know, and like, yeah. we'd all be okay if someone would just get rid of this person. And please, those listening, I'm not advocating for violence. I'm, I'm talking about that shadow element of myself yeah. that... Being honest with thought process. Yeah, I'm just going, wow, that's a really kind of crazy thought to have, Luke, you know? But then beyond that is the realization that in the great scheme of things, in this duality that the creator has gifted us, this kind of playground of spectrum of experience that we have to work with, that villain, if the human level of consciousness as a whole is still at the same place at which we find ourselves now, that, that villain will just be replaced by another one because there's a void there in consciousness, right? So you could throw George Soros in jail for life and then, you know, his son or someone who's been indoctrinated by his way of thinking uh, or his thirst for power or control or whatever it is that's motivating his behavior, um, it's just going to fill that void, right? So even just to punish an individual isn't even a viable solution because what we're dealing with is a level of consciousness that's producing that kind of actor mm. and allowing that sort of actor to rise to the highest levels of uh, the echelon of our society yeah. and positions of power within our various institutions, right? So it's kind of, you're going after the symptom of something rather than the cause. Mm. And, you know, perhaps the cause is what you're speaking of, which is cultivating within ourselves a sense of um, unconditional compassion, unconditional forgiveness, yet at the same time, being willing to go to court and through the proper channels, holding bad actors accountable. Yeah, and, and it may be the only way to save those people. I, it certainly is because as as they're allowed to do these things, it, it ne they never come to that come to Jesus moment. Uh, but if if they're brought to a place where they're brought to their knees, it actually can be the only mechanism where they, they can have a turnaround. So you, you think about it differently where when you do things that are genuinely loving in the place of love, it actually benefits every single person. You think there always has to be a loser, but what if there's never a loser, right? Because... It, because truth is that liberating and universal reality. There's verses in the Bible that talk about it. Uh, it's in First John, you can do nothing against the truth, but for the truth. So, and yeah, Romans 14, God will use all things together for those that love him and are called according to his purpose. So all things there, you know, it's, it's about truth being the, uh, and, and love being the un, under, underwriting uh, factor that allows this to uh, create a better reality. But I think that that's the interesting con concept of how do you stop evil? And you get indoctrinated by the movies that you stop evil by killing evil. But guess what happens when you kill evil? You become evil in that process. And evil is uh, immortalized in your own deeds. You The print of Everything they are is imprinted in you and it's inescapable. It's seeped into your soul. And that's the purpose of it. That's how evil works. And so you see societies that I mentioned before we jump back on camera of the Rwandan genocide with the Hutus and the Tutsis in the mid-90s and how this was the most horrific example of around a million people being murdered in, in, in days. And tribe on tribe violence and people that were sentenced to life imprisonment in the Rwandan prisons and then the prisons being 
I've had this happen. I've been in prisons where the prisoners were starving. They didn't have food there. And this was happening. And so these prisoners were starving to death. And guess who came to the rescue to feed those people? In this case, you can see it, it's been documented. It was even filmed and documented where the families that had relatives, loved ones, spouses, children murdered by these individuals and knew who they were, were the ones delivering the food to them. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's so wild. Mm. You think about that and then kind of put yourself up for inventory, like mm. I'm a pretty good person. I'm not that good of a person. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm not that good is the right word. It, but yeah. It's no, like, it's, wow, talk about a higher level of heart, you know? Isn't that something, right? It's unfathomable. And, uh, I, and I think that none of us have that, you know, in this moment, I would say that those people before that moment had occurred, they, they would have been cultivating these types of things, but they didn't naturally just possess it. I think it's a divine thing where circumstances, when you invite it, then as circumstances amplify, you get granted more grace, more power, more, more divine love. Because it, otherwise, it's super overwhelming. You think, oh man, what would I do if really bad circumstances happened? And you, but it depends, what are we cultivating? So we're growing in one direction and then we're, we're kind of asking and inviting that supernatural power. Because that to me is just completely divine. I can't explain it. I don't think there's any way to explain those actions considering that the same you know, thing you go back you know, months before or, or years before, uh, depending on the case, then this was total genocide between tribes. So how is humanity cap capable of such evil and then such good? And is it some people just predisposed to evil and they, they just think about these things and they just want to do it? According to Ted Bundy in his last interview, the electric chair was being tested while the interview was taking place and the lights are going out while the interview is taking place. And he explains how all the things that he was exposed to helped to create him in the way he was and his indulgence in those things. But he says, there's so many people out there in the world just like me and you need to understand this mechanism. Basically, he was explaining something that a lot of people don't want to know, which is you can actually make yourself evil. And it's about what you expose yourself to and choose to put into your mind. And he talked about the fact that it was violence and pornography combined, which is a very common theme in movies that people don't realize is getting overlapped. And it's associating these things together so you no longer can do things normally and sex in a normal or giving and beautiful way is no longer satisfying. And it's... it's, it's um, it, satisfaction is being based on uh, the pain that is being inflicted upon somebody else. And so that's amplifying. And these are things that are surprisingly coming out all through uh, media today. And it's creating this reality. It's scarring the souls of people. And so you can cultivate evil and you can cultivate good. Before he died, he appears that he was a man that actually did change from if you watch the footage and you meditate. You, when I say meditate, you just try to take out all judgment and biases. You try to work out where is this person coming from? He says from his own lips that he had largely healed. Um, so he's even using, uh, he's not trying to ask for, to get taken out of his sentence. He says that he deserves what has happened to him and that he cannot, he understands he cannot be allowed back into society. He confesses more crimes even during that interview in detail. So it's more incriminating. His reason for sharing what he shared seems to be solely for the benefit of a better future for humanity and the concern of what is underpinning the creation of the monster that that can be activated for any of us wow that is wild i thought you might find it interesting yeah very interesting um in just the couple minutes that we have here i feel i feel like this is a bit of a regression <laughs> yeah. the earlier part of the conversation we're sort of exploring the problem and now we're in the solution but yeah I, I I would regret if I didn't just explore this with you briefly. Um, you're someone who creates media, as I yeah. do. You're using the medium of film. You've operated seemingly outside of the confines of Hollywood and the funding of studios and really outside of that machine. Um, you know, I lived in Hollywood for 32 years and worked in that industry. And I'm a huge fan of art and media and film and music and all those things. Um, but I did observe while being a part of that and also just a consumer of content that there, and especially after leaving there, I think, um, 
there was definitely a lot of programming going on in the media. There's a lot of predictive programming of kind of them telling us what they're going to do before they do it um, in terms of mm. films about a viral outbreak. And it's just so closely mirrors what actually ends up happening and on and on and on. And, um, and all of the kind of, you know, recorded occult worship in Hollywood and this sort of dark, seedy underbelly. And, uh, of course, all of the um, exposed... Um, um, situations um, of sexual scandal and abuse and pedophilia and all of this kind of stuff. Uh, what's your take on kind of the downside of Hollywood and how it's used even on record by organizations like the CIA and different covert groups uh, within and outside of the government to sort of mold the mind of, of people and to really dictate uh, society and lead people in one way or another. Yeah, no, thanks for asking that. I think that people need to understand that their values are being uh, served to them. And so basically you, you're you getting these downloads without you realizing of what you ought to believe and your moral framework is all being created for you when you, I would say, mindlessly consume these things. Even if you're consuming them intentionally, it depends what what is it that you're putting in? So one of the things that happened in Hollywood was that Anton LaVey, he was the author of the Satanic Bible and he worked directly with Hollywood and you can see the history of him. He was the one that actually discovered Norma Jean, known as Marilyn Monroe in a strip club and brought her into Hollywood. He was her lover. Um, so, And she was a traumatized individual, which is why he preyed upon her. She had lots of childhood trauma. So that was basically, if you understand mind control and how that works, uh, it's to do with finding either people that have been traumatized or people that you traumatize and then you, through those splits that are created in that trauma, you have abilities to control. But anyway, this individual, Anton LaVey, worked with Hollywood specifically to insert characters into films, which was previously illegal, where you would insert a character into a film that would perform mostly moral acts for the film, but they would do one or more uh, debased acts that were not considered to be a moral thing. But because it was the hero or the heroine that was doing these things, it actually would then shape society's values. And he speaks directly about how he was working to do that. And so do you ever remember watching a film where you're just like, why did that character just do that? That just felt off. Like it just, you just like felt something break. And what had happened is you just being broken into a new value of saying, but you just, the the eerie part of it is it is the part where you see it 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 it's like stomach churning you just like he just killed an innocent person or he killed a bad person but he was you know he was tied up and you, how did he do do this and you just you're whatever it was or I uh, she or he slept with someone but they were married but then there was a justification for it because they're so in love but that's normally a value where you think no well, it's not good to cheat. Uh, but but you justified it within the storyline. Let's, let's say the notebook. It all makes sense. But even though, why doesn't she just have a conversation with them and close the relationship up so that you're not breaking your own internal code? But no, it was intentional that way. It's about breaking the values. And so and then you feel, oh, this is justified. You just had your value changed. And then you're wondering why you can't hold relationships properly. What have you been fed? Why are you wondering why you can't stop losing your temper? What have you been fed? What are your values? And you, they've been fed to you. You have to unplug and break the program because it's mind control. It's subtle, but it's all based on values. Very interesting. Yeah. And one thing I find very troubling about this particular topic is the targeting of children. And yeah. we see this as increasingly prevalent in our culture now in media and i mean god it's like a topic i don't even want to touch because it's just so uh, highly charged yeah. but myself as a grown man who was abused as a child mm. i was groomed as a child i'm very familiar with that mechanism of action and wow. and not only how it can happen and some of the tools that are used by by groomers and uh, abusers but also the incredible incredible devastation to one's life mm. um, that thankfully I've been able to largely recover from and thrive and even use as part of my, my gift, you know, mm. wow. in many ways. That's amazing. But many don't. Yeah. You know, most probably. Yeah. And so I see these things in the media and some of the, and I'm not like a puritanical guy. I mean, I'm 
by all the social constructs, quite liberal, right? Like, do whatever you want as long as you don't hurt anyone kind of guy. Um, but just seeing the books that they're putting in schools and all of this pornographic um, subliminal uh, symbolism in Disney movies and, you know, exposing kids to sexual themes in a uh, guised in, you know, inclusivity of different genders and sexual preferences and things like that, um, which... I think has its has its place maybe at a certain age, right? <laughs> you know, that you, you make a kid aware of human sexuality in, in a way that's um, productive and healthy. But I can't help, based on my personal experience, observe that in media it's becoming so prevalent that children are being indoctrinated into this um, very premature understanding of sexuality. And not mm. only sexuality, but in some cases... Um, largely morally perverse sexuality. And I don't mean perverse in that someone is not heterosexual. I just mean perverse in that outside of social norms, right? Yeah, totally. And so it's like, it's terrifying to me as someone who's, you know, in the process of hopefully having a kid. I'm like, how am I going to shield my kid from being groomed not by a person or an individual, but by culture and by media? You know, am I going to have to sit there like, over their shoulder with, you know, what, what do you have on the iPad there, kid? You know, it's like everywhere you turn, seemingly there, there is this um, very powerful influence to sort of corrupt our youth, for lack yeah. of a better term. So what have you discovered about that? What's your perspective on that? How is it being done? How can one um, help to sort of protect their own or avoid that influence? Yeah, no, thanks for asking that. It's, it's very concerning just had a instance with a with a relative where the children um uh, young children by another child that was you know about 5 years older essentially raped uh, just within the last few months and you see these examples super traumatic and this it really just threw you know this this relative's life out of out of order and it, but thankfully there's you know healing taking place and all of these things but it's a reminder and it's it's horrifying so just and and i and thank you for sharing about th your your challenges of what you went through as a child because it really helps the listener and it really helps us all to be able to be in the open because i'm sure you're so aware of the fact that it's the things that we hide and that we're ashamed about that that cannot heal, but things that are brought into the light, we're actually inviting that healing and it's just open in that way. And we're not shaming that anymore. So it's very liberating and powerful that, that you choose to speak about that and give others permission to do that. Not that they need permission, but it's, it's a great space to create. So the mechanism that I've seen take place with this, so you have the ones that a lot of people would be familiar about when Simba lies down on the cliff face and then the the sprinkles go up into the sky of the dust particles they fly up fly up and they write the word sex in the sky or the front cover of the little mermaid with the phallus so it's a you know the penis the head it's the shaft it's all just right there that one i'm familiar with and that like i didn't i thought it was a meme that someone made just to clown on disney or something and i was like no holy shit they actually did that yeah and it's just, oh yeah, that's fine. Uh, what? And then, and, but it's so bizarre. You'd be like, well, why would they do that? Because you just think it's just so bizarre. It doesn't make sense. Like, why would they do this? And you know, the characters are often very provocative as well. Or they, it's a children's film, but the, the, the what the some of the characters are wearing, everything is kind of flopping and f flailing out. You know, there's obviously the priest and that's marrying Ursula, that's disguised as someone else with, what's his name, Eric, and his you know, penis flops out and you know it's under his cloak still, but it's clearly bouncing around there. Why are they this showing us these Disney things? This is in Disney cartoon? That's in Little Mermaid. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, and then, you know, all the new and modern stuff that's coming out, typically what they also is saying that is... Well, we want children and parents to watch this film, so we put lots of subliminal messages in for the parents so they can laugh about it. And But the issue is, do we really need the parents to be equally entertained as the children, so much so that we'd be okay with them getting subliminal sexual messages that we find funny, but that's way beyond them? Should they 
you know, should they be exposed to this? I can't find any reason why someone would say yes to that. They're too young. Um, children, uh, everyone should know about the biology of that. It takes time to develop these, uh, these aspects. And so why would they be doing this? This actually is one of the best ways to make humanity ultra controllable because you operate under this premise where you are so basely motivated by things. And so you're motivated and persuaded by your appetites. And that's what pushes and pulls you into the things that navigates and governs your choices. And so this is incredibly destructive, but people don't realize. And in terms of people who want to do the research and look at the MK Ultra mind control experiment, which is what Bill Clinton was making an apology for when he said the words, I want to apologize for the experiments that were conducted in this country that were unethical during the time that they were conducted and unethical during today's standards. And when you research that, which is declassified, meaning that it's public and it's publicized, uh, that they explained that sexual trauma was used for mind control and, and physical trauma. And so sexualization was actually used to make the mind more... Uh, putting putting us into a more suggestible state and then we can then be given commands of doing certain things and you start to realize why is it so many people are so complicit in all types of things that are so wrong let's say if this v is a very toxic and poisonous substance and it's harming people why do people seem so complicit in it and then even willing to dob in you know family members pressure other family members why is that happening and you start to realize why do we why are we operating like a mind control society? And then you look at the media and the types of things that we're consuming and that we're exposed to, and you realize we've been hypersexualized, which has actually caused the framework of how we make judgments and choices to be marred. And we are operating in these states that then mean that we are basically powerless against a controller because we are controlled by our sexual desires. Not We are not in control of them. They are in control of us. Once you have that, you have an, uh, you know, basically if you were to see things spiritually, you'd have spiritual, mental, physical, and that's the hierarchy. So your spiritual then, it then helps you to understand and to, so your, which would be your morals and beliefs that would go into that category. Then that would help shape your, your mental framework of the things that your state of happiness and where that comes from, which would be in connection to the spirituality. And then that would oversee the physicality of what things we do, whether we choose to, um, punch or kick or fight somebody or have sex with somebody or you know that would be all in the physical realm and so if that's out of whack that this the mental is not governing the appetites of the physicality then that's where people can be completely out of control do violent things do sexual things that are completely wrong and perverse uh yeah so you you throw that out of whack and it's that's what we're seeing wow <laughs> it's so wild to watch People often ask me why I'm so obsessed with red light therapy. I've been doing it for years, and frankly, I plan to continue forever due to its incredible benefits. Thousands, yes, I said thousands, of peer-reviewed research articles have demonstrated the benefits of red and near-infrared light for things like skin health, reduced pain and inflammation, and faster muscle recovery. I love to do my red light first thing in the morning to get the red light I might get from watching the sunrise. And as red light therapies become so popular, there are several different red light therapy companies now, but I personally use and recommend Juve for a few reasons. First, they offer a wide selection of configurations from small handheld devices to large setups that can treat your entire body. I personally use both. Another feature I love with Juve's latest generation of products is something they called ambient mode which utilizes lower intensity red light designed to be used at night as a healthy alternative to bright blue light, which protects your melatonin levels and as a result, your sleep. This is what I use in the kitchen at night in our temporary apartment to balance out the blue light of the nasty overhead lighting. So if you want to get down with some red light, Juve has got you covered. And for a limited time, they're offering all my listeners, including you, an exclusive discount on your first order. Just go to juve.com slash Luke and apply my code Luke to your qualifying order. That's J-O-O-V-V dot com forward slash Luke. And of course, some exclusions apply as this is a limited time offer. So hurry up and grab your Juve now. Sometimes I think, I'm 51 at the time of this recording, sometimes I think, 
I'm just getting older and therefore more conservative, you know? <laughs> and like, maybe everything's cool. It's like when I was a teenager, it was reckless abandon and I hated all rules and all social norms and wanted to break that as a little punk rock teenager. Um, so, you know, there might be something to do with that, sort of some wisdom in hindsight and seeing, mm -hmm. but it's interesting to observe. And I was thinking about this last night. Um, my mom's parents were very strict and conservative and just really kept a tight leash on her when she was a girl um, in a repressive manner, right? That was her experience, according to her sharing that with me. So when I was a kid, it was kind of anything goes. You know, I was given lots of love and affection. But for example, um, I remember I had a little box in my room that she was not allowed to look in. And we made that agreement, which is cool but what did i keep in there i started to keep weed in there and paraphernalia and it was my little drug box but she promised not to look in there right and um i was also allowed to swear you know and use profanity which i thought was super cool i could show off to my friends they'd come over and i'd be like what's up fucker you know my friends are waiting for me to get grounded my mom's just over there doing the dishes hanging out and, you know um i couldn't say racist or sexist words but i could use swear words which is pretty cool I was allowed to read Playboys and have like playmates up on the wall and things like that. So I grew up in a very liberal, free household on my mom's side. My dad, much more conservative and strict. And that also, as wonderful as that was as a kid, also had repercussions in terms of, mm. you know, downstream, my relationship to sexuality and relationships being lensed through pornography that I was exposed to, um, that I sought out and was exposed to as a kid and things like that, right? And so now it's like there's kind of this boomerang I see within myself of leaning into more somewhat, I think, centrist or conservative values where I think, wow, that's really not appropriate for a kid. But perhaps part of it is a reaction to my own subjective experience, mm. having been exposed to drugs and sex and all of these things kind of at an early age and having been abused and like really exposed to sex, wow. you know? Yeah. So I, you know, I don't know what there is in there. It's just kind of a self-inquiry and observation. I think it's to, a good one. As to how I form my, my world view. It seems that as individuals, we um, can have a polar, polarized reaction to early experience. And perhaps if it was kind of a little too loose, we can grow up and get a bit more contracted. And if we were too confined um, in our exploration of what it means to be a person, then perhaps later in life, one could kind of go off the deep end and expand the opposite end of that. Yeah, that's very interesting. My, my take on it would be a slight variation where I would say that because you have been on that side of the pendulum, like uh, super explorative, that it has allowed you to understand things that wouldn't necessarily have to be understood that way. Because like, say, for example, my background would be on the other side, but not completely at all because I was exposed to pornography as well. And that became something that was a vice for me at different periods of my life. Uh, thankfully, not anymore, which I'm very grateful for. But, but that was all like a healing exercise. But it's interesting that it's, for me, when I look at, my exploration of these things and I, I start to realize, oh, wow, now I've actually understood something that appeared so attractive and fun, exhilarating and carefree that had no problems associated with it. I see the problems that have happened. I see how it's caused pain. And so that's caused a deeper understanding. So it's not necessarily that you know, I'm getting older. Well, the, the, older, the age is contributing to a, a wealth of experience. Uh, and some of those things being things that are kind of scarring and hurtful that I would you know, prefer if I, I don't really feel like I want to erase things out of my life, but I, I wouldn't go and do it again or feel like it was essential. I could have found it, you know, for example, a, a good example, I got a three-year-old and a 10-month-old. I, I don't have to beat my, one of my children senseless to realize that it's not a good idea to beat him senseless. Like I could just know from the love that it's great to just love him and to be very kind to him, discipline him in ways that you know, don't cause him trauma. Uh, so you, you see what I mean? It's, there are things that we can do to, to discover truth outside of you know, going down rabbit holes because you're, you're a married man, I'm a married man. There's certain things that would be very hard if I went and explored life with another partner. These things went through my mind at one point when, when we just um, my relationship wasn't uh, it wasn't working out, even though I had strong and have strong Christian values, my desire for comfort then caused my mind to consider and even my wife to consider, oh, what would it be like to be with somebody else or something like this? And then, but thankfully we, we just, we saw that we had those thoughts and then we just said, okay, well, it, let's, let's 
put this behind us and close the door to this because this is not going to be something that's easy to recover from. Some and people do recover from it, but why do that? Because it's just going to it's just going to hurt self and others. Yeah. yeah. Um, to wrap up in terms of the influence on media and and the influence not only of now what we're being exposed to sometimes overtly sometimes covertly and the messaging and programming that's being instilled in us without our knowing um we also have now this incredible suppression of information in the way of censorship right Mm -hmm. which i'm sure you're familiar with due to the controversial nature of the content that you create yeah Uh, where do you see this going you know are we are we going to have this minister of truth in the in the regime now come in and just shut down the internet and cut people like me and you out of the uh, conversation um, is there going to be an emergence of you know blockchain platforms or things that are going to evade the powers that be uh, are we going to become more savvy about the programming that's taking place it seems we are i yeah. mean i think that was one of the positive things about president uh, trump you know <laughs> despite all of his many flaws is that he really, for whatever reason, called out the media and caused a huge swath of the population to, you know, uh, discredit them, you know, mm. as, as they rightly deserved in many cases. Um, where do you see the arts and communication going in the age of censorship um, and, and this programming? I think it's a very interesting paradigm that we're venturing into because, yes, censorship has being unprecedented there's certain things that people are not used to it where you just posted something on facebook it's been deleted you've been put in facebook jail you you've you've tried to follow someone but then it said you know you can't follow this person because they shared information about covid uh then it's so bizarre but i think what's really interesting then you have this thing of elon buying twitter and and then there's this resurgence of people saying wow this is going to be a yeah you know, this is going to be free speech right now And I can't predict every outcome of the things that may happen, but I can say that it's interesting that historically there's this concept called Hegelian dialectic. Not sure if you've heard of it, but it's two dueling ideas, which is thesis against antithesis, which is what creates the desired outcome, which is synthesis. So what would be the thesis and antithesis of censorship? Well, censorship versus free speech. And so, but... The key, if, if there are elites or if there is an agenda, if there is evil and good and these things are over, over um, shadowing, controlling or whatever, then what would happen potentially would be that, yes, the free speech argument, maybe there is an er- era of free speech. But, and, then, and then maybe it's it can, it, dueling up against the censorship and they go kind of, it's a, it's a boxing match. But it's designed in this way because as long as it still operates outside of the context of love, it never evolves anyway. And so there's a a line from the band Fallout Boy, which from all their symbology, they have like occultic, just like a lot of the bands, they look like they've been through this uh, Freemasonry thing. Again, I could, you know, they, they can listen to this and tell me that they're not, but, um, but yeah, they have this line, I, I'm an arms dealer equipping you with weapons in the form of words. And I don't really care which side wing wins as long as the room keeps singing. And then the chorus is, I'm a leading man and the lies I weave are oh so intricate, oh so intricate. Uh, and then, you know, just uh, all the prima donnas of the gutter. Um, we paint your trash gold while you're sleeping. Um, I wrote the gospel of giving up you look pretty sinking, like strange lines that are kind of very dark, but just talking about these dueling components. There's the Coldplay song, Viva La Vida, never an honest word. That was when I ruled the world. Uh, so it's it, the dishonesty still to me, whether it's free speech or censorship, the dishonesty of the mechanism that's behind this. And because it's, it's just such a, the play is bigger. What we're actually fighting for is not freedom even though it involves freedom. We're not fighting for free speech, even though it involves free speech. We're not fighting for these things. We fight for love. And, and, and it's not even a fight. It's we live according to love. And that's historically, uh, this, is my, this is my take on it, that that's what we strive for. It's, it, it's not about opposing things. It's about living the, the greatest manifestation and, and relevant and 
uh, yeah, actualization of love. And so what I'm saying, even with the, Rwanda, the Rwanda genocide example is you know, what is it that ends the, the evil? What is it that finally just stops it in its tracks? And it is love. Like you see examples, the, these criminals, their, their hearts were so broken by what had been done by these people. The, the love, you can see even there's a, a, a two guys on tour in Puerto Rico where one of them had killed a relative of the other and they're on tour together talking about violence. And you see uh, examples where even uh, a, a child was killed by another child and the parent, of the, child, the parent of the child that had been killed takes in the child, the, mur the murderer. Wow. You can look at these examples that exist. And so what I'm saying is when these things happen, that's when evil finally is met. But it's met with love in such a way that it heals the core of everything that's going on here. And so I'm, the issue is not that evil is so evil. It's that the good is not actually, we're not seeing examples of, of this goodness. We're not seeing it. We're not sensing or feeling it. It's, it's causing us not to up level because there will always be, darkness in the world as far as like let's say what the bible would talk about but it basically explains that none of this is in the heart of god and if people up level and and find this love then they, they can be taken out of the of the darkness so i think that's the only real answer i have for people which i think is the greatest answer which is don't look for external factors to validate the love and the reality that you can have in this moment, regardless of the Illuminati, the darkness, the bad guys, what they're doing to you. It's not, it doesn't have to affect you. You can have love and joy and peace in your life because the source that you get that from it is on access all the time, every moment of every day. And that is only pure love. And my favorite verse in the Bible is actually 1 John 1, 5 that says, in God is light and there is no darkness at all. Because that's my escape from all of this. And, and so that's where the joy comes from. Awesome, man. I think we did it, bro. <laughs> Thank you, sir. That's Welcome. what was missing yesterday. Yeah. You know, I was like, there's one more piece here or a few more pieces to kind of complete the mosaic of the beginning of our conversation. So mm -hmm. thank you so much. I want to ask you one final question. Sure. Who are three teachers or teachings that have influenced your life or your work that you'd like to share with us? Sure. So... Uh, obviously, the first one people already guess it, but Jesus, not just the way that he, the way the, the way that he taught, the way that he uh, interacted with people, the life that he lived, his life of nonviolence, it, it to me is deeply inspiring. So, uh, in amidst the worst possible scenarios, so that nonviolence, non retaliation, non judgment in contexts where it would warrant all those things, as far as I'm concerned. So that's why he's my greatest teacher and uh, role model in all things. Uh, secondly, the I find the Protestant reformers very inspiring in their stance during the 1500s. So that would be whether it was, they had many flaws though. So, so people have to understand they still did perpetuate violence as well. Some of them, uh, Martin Luther though, uh, just some of his stand to me was just such a beautiful stand and that he was really contending with freedom of conscience, which is really the underpinning of freedom of speech. It was freedom of conscience. And he, they, they risked all, and many people were burnt alive at the stake just for the stand, which really did create an underpinning for what we have today, which is the free, any freedom that we experienced, they were a part of helping to create that. So they, they are inspirational to me in that, even though they are flawed, incredibly flawed individuals, just like the rest of us. And then finally, I would say, you said, um, yeah, th speakers and thought leaders. Um, Anyone. Yeah. 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 A friend of mine, a really good friend of mine, Adrian Ebens, he's uh, written a lot of really amazing books. And, you know, he has a website where he published all these books for free, all understanding uh, God's character and how, how to open the heart to love. And I remember it was when I was reading these books and I was understanding God in a different way. I felt my mind, I, like literally it was as if my mind was deprogramming. And I, that was what like basically saved my marriage with my wife and allowed me to be able to open my heart in ways that I hadn't before. And I didn't realize that it was all coming from a dark view of God. So he was very helpful for me in that. And the, the things that he's written on these subjects, I think are, are like really profound and helpful. Awesome. Thank you so much. We're going to put uh, links to those awesome. mentioned your films, your website at lukestory.com slash auto. Man, thank you so much for making the time yesterday and being willing to come back today and wrap a bow on this gift of a conversation. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, man.
I want to thank you for having the stamina to get through this uh, this episode. Well, I guess it was kind of two episodes crammed into one. For those of you that listened, you'll know what I mean. Uh, if this was a bit heavy for you, you'll find some sweet relief in next week's show. It's number 419. It's called Let There Be Light, How to Illuminate Consciousness and Biology with third time and wildly popular guest and my friend, Mr. Matt Maruka. So next week's show is one I'm really looking forward to sharing with you. Back to Jonathan. If you want to check out Jonathan's incredible archive of alternative health documentaries, here's where you find them. Go to lukestory.com slash health secrets. That's lukestory.com slash health secrets. Or if you're kind of tech savvy, you can just click that link on your podcast app show notes and it'll take you right there where you will find his, uh, his whole collection of films. And they are incredible. As you might have guessed from this conversation, he leaves no stone unturned and gives zero Fs about what uh, the mainstream media might have to say about his approach to creating content. Let's finally, last but not least, give some huge love to our show sponsors, Inside Tracker, Newtopia, Juve, and Joy Mode. Four incredible brands out there to help you live your best life. And I want to let you know you can find them all in my online store at lukestory.com slash store. All right, I'll be back next week with Matt Maruka. 